Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I, I'd not heard that secret folder story before, so that's quite gratifying. Oh. <laughs> hang on to that um yeah so here's the pamphlet which yeah i did write before all the monoliths started popping up um but yeah i guess it was one of those things but then that meant that i was determined to have it published then because otherwise all the all the mysterious monoliths appearing around the world were for nothing. Um, I cheated slightly, I think, writing this pamphlet because it's a sequence of poems, or it ended up being a sequence of poems, and it's very much just um, things that happened in real life, um, which you'll see um, beginning sort of when I was 14 or 15. Um, and it became a, a really sort of interdependent sequence, which was quite nice and sort of a bit new to me, but I really enjoyed um, doing. So despite that, I hope that there'll be something that is relevant to you um, and it's not just kind of a diary. Um, I've got a, an epigraph at the beginning by Diane Arbus. Um, and she said, I began to miss light like it really is. And I'm just gonna read um, some poems um, from the beginning and some towards the end. Monolith. I noticed it one morning, all 50 feet projecting from a square of lawn at the far end of the garden. Dad insists it's always been there. He's sure we brought it with us from the house where we used to live, but I find this difficult to stomach, me not seeing earlier, given its shadow falls right across my window for most of the day, its glassy grey surface throwing light back, dazzling, prying neighbours and low-flying birds. I would have noticed, except growing flush round its base is a daffodil rim in uninterrupted spring bloom, which fits with what dad says, or at least implies the monolith didn't land or spring up overnight. There's no chance these flowers could survive that unscathed. I watched them, a row of dancing stars, like a halo concussion round a cartoon's head. Monotone. I've been stockpiling hairspray, growing my hair. When it's 50 feet long, I'll raise and set it vertical. My progress assessed against a tape measure. Before long, I'll need more. I've been thinking of logistics. A scaffold might be necessary for the final erection to hold it steady above my head when I'm reborn at last as an artifact. For some reason, my vision strikes them as obsessive. They say it looks as if I've not been sleeping, which is true, but nothing to do with the volume of my hair. It's that monolithic silence from the garden, keeping me awake. The doctor nods and gives me my medicines. I hold them in my palm like the future. Dependent on producer, they're capsules of pale green and yellow or plain green like daffodil buds. It's two to be taken each day. Soon I'll start to feel better. So to speed up the process, I swallow two fistfuls and lie down in bed. Monosyllabic. In here, glass is like cash. A shard from a vase or jar is good to trade. I sneak a piece of fish bowl in my shoe heel. When the head nurse asks me for the truth, I say, no, I'm clean, and think of my pet fish in his cup. 
Most kids find a crack in the wall or a grate they can lift to hide their stash. Mine is in a hole at the foot of my quilt. I think the plan is to hoard till there's glass to make a full pane out of, to look through it and catch sight of the sun in the sky. This one girl, a teen like me, she's been in here for a long time. She's stored so much glass she can build a whole door to slide back step through and walk off site a bell rings a light flares in the hall when it's been three hours at least and they in some way get her back she screams so loud a nurse has to pin her to the floor with a jab to the side to help her sleep I watch this all from the lounge. I sit in a worn blue chair and sip my warm, not too hot cup of tea. I should move if I'm quick. I can find out where they take her glass while she's out cold. What poem do I put next? <laughs> oh no, yeah, you can skip past that, sorry. Yeah, monorail. Monorail. I once got so scared of Dawn's sober approach, resorted to wandering streets for a night that lasted a year home somehow the far side of the train depot but I turned into this estate and gotten all spun around in the air glow all these grey structures looked 50 feet tall and identical looking back on that time I picture a maze misprinted on the back of a pub kitchen's kids menu a tantrum swirl of grey crayon there's this question posed by historians of how best to memorialize a tragic event. In most of the circles that ask, it's accepted. The purpose is not just to build a museum, to be walked around leisurely, holding up colorful maps and walkie-talkie audio guides. It should be remembrance of what's lost, yes, but also an uncomfortable reminder of what doesn't bear repeating. It should hurt to occupy that space again. So why is there a drawer in my wardrobe chock full of hideous commemorative t-shirts? My kitchen cupboards are stacked with souvenir glassware I'd never want a guest to find. Um, and finally, thank you for listening, everyone. Um, and thank you everyone else for reading and I'm looking forward to hearing who's next. Uh, Monody. Us two sat on one side of a beer garden bench behind the bell when you reached inside your bag to grab a miniature wine and pulled out a silver blister pack instead by accident accident flinging a lone loose tablet to the ground a white and yellow daffodil sprung up where it landed between a crumpled beer mat and an empty baggie I recognized myself there in the dirt promising I'd watch over the flower ensure its growth was guarded from careless footfall but once it started wilting dropping its crowned head to the earth like a sexless monk or a drunk retching in the road. I couldn't stand to look at it. The way it bowed so earnestly made me want to run across a beach and put my foot through the turrets of sand some kid spent all day building. Please go easy on me. It was never my intention to share this with anyone. Thank you.